for the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about angels and demons. And this is a fascinating topic and really a reminder to all of us that we live not just in a natural world, but the world in which we live is indeed very supernatural. You look around at our culture and it's obvious that people are fascinated by the supernatural and by the superhuman. A testament to that is simply look at all of the Hollywood blockbusters and you immediately see uh, superhuman people doing superhuman or people with superhuman uh, strength and ability, the Black Panther and the Avenger characters, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man. Movies like Star Wars that center around the use of something called the Force or more overt movies that deal with witchcraft such as the Harry Potter series. And then you go to television and when you watch what's happening there with Lucifer, shows like Lucifer, X-Files, Grim, Evil, I mean honestly anything with witches, vampires, zombies, monsters is in. And the question really becomes, why are, so, why are people so fascinated by the supernatural? And I think there's several reasons. One of them is because many of those shows are formatted to portray a good versus evil conflict. And there is something in humanity that delights when evil is defeated, when the wrong is righted. As well, we're eternal beings. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, he set eternity in our hearts. So there's something in us innately that longs for more than the monotony of the natural world and a simply human existence or experience. And then I think for some Christians, the fact of the matter is they have not understood the Bible, and so the stories in the Bible seem tame, and the characters seem either very old or ordinary. As one man writes, a lot of Christians imagine what they imagine to be true about the unseen world isn't. Angels don't have wings. Cherubim don't count because they are never called angels and are creaturely. And while the Bible describes demonic possession in rightfully awful ways, intelligent evil has more sinister things than to make sock puppets out of people. On top of that, angels and demons are minor players. Church never seems to get to the big boys and their agenda. So one of the things we want to do is in this series, to look at some things regarding angels and demons, but especially supernatural beings, what their agenda is, what the Bible has to say about it, and to go a little deeper than we might ordinarily go to give it some time, so to speak. This morning, then, is simply an introduction, and we're going to cover three areas. The first one I want you to see is, number one, and we have to start here, there is only one God. There is only one God. It's important to start with that observation, that the gods of this world are not gods. They are not gods in the way that our God is God. Our God, one God, revealed to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here's what I mean by he is the only one, and there is no equal to him. First of all, he is the only eternal God. He is with Without beginning and without end, there was never a time when he did not exist. No one created him. No one fashioned him. No one called him forth. He has always existed and always will. He alone is omniscient. 
There is no other God who knows all things. Omniscience is the idea that God knows everything. He knows it equally. He knows it effortlessly. There's never a time God is learning anything. There's never a time that God watches what is happening and says, oh, I never thought they would do that. Or, oh, you mean, really, that's how you feel? He never learns anything. He knows all things. He is also the only God because he is the only one who is omnipotent. That is a theological word that means all powerful. There is no equal to his power. There is no exhaustion of his power because he has all power. All power comes from him. All power is through him. All power it derives from him. If any being has any power, it's because God is the one who has empowered them with the power that they have. I mean, he not only has all power, he holds everything together. Colossians chapter 1, he holds all things together. He alone is omnipresent. That is to say, he is everywhere simultaneously. He doesn't have to go anywhere because he is already there. That is not true of any other God you can imagine. That is not true of any other spiritual being that you can name. He is in the past, he is in the present, and he is in the future simultaneously. His name is I Am. He is the ever-present, eternally existent, right where you're at now, God. He is not I was. He is not I will be. He is I am. Here's another truth about God. He cannot be touched by evil or corrupted by evil. He did not create evil. He is not the cause of evil. He is above evil, and he is opposed to evil. We're going to learn. You say, well, where did evil come from? You're going to learn that next week. <laughs> hey, I'm just telling you, this is an introduction. None of those statements I've just made are true of any other created being. None of those statements are true of Satan or any other evil being or good being. There is no, you could say, counterpart to God. He is in a class by himself unequaled by anyone else or anything in all creation. This is what we're talking about primarily when we say God is holy. We're not so much talking about his purity, though he is pure. What we're talking about is his otherness, his uniqueness, his utter uniqueness, you might say. He is not like anything or anyone. He's holy. He's different. All of that simply to remind ourselves at the start that when we're talking about a, a battle between the good and evil, it's not even a fair fight. God is God by himself, alone, in a class by himself, the champion for all time and eternity. There is never a time he will ever be defeated. There is never a time that his plan will not prevail. There is never a time that his purpose for you, his purpose for creation, or his pur purpose for the culmination of history will ever be less than his perfect will. He's God. Second, God created supernatural beings. He created supernatural beings. We know he created human beings in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, but prior to that, he created supernatural beings. In Psalm 148, we read this, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. From the heavens, praise him in the heights above. 
Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Why? For he commanded and they were created. He is the one who created the heavenly host. He is the one who created supernatural beings. He is the one who created everything that is, and that includes every supernatural being. These beings, are, therefore, are not God. They are not equal to God because, unlike God, they were created. There was a time when they did not exist, and he created them and brought them into existence. We do know this, that these beings witness the creation of the world. In Job chapter 38, God speaking to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And I want to pause here for just a moment because a lot of times people are like, well, you know, I believe in God, but he's got some explaining to do. I want to know about this, and I want to know about that, and until I understand, and that was where Job in the midst of his sorrow and his, his horrific trial, he said, I want some answers. And God comes to Job, and God says, listen, why don't you tell me how the earth was created? Where were you when that happened? In other words, what God is saying in a wonderful way, in a kind way is, Job, you can't understand the natural world with its mysteries. How would you ever begin to understand the unseen world with its mysteries? He says, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The Supernatural beings were there at the creation of the world. Would you notice that these beings are called morning stars? They are called the sons of God. They are called heavenly hosts, as we saw in the previous verse. They are called angels. And we may use the word angels to describe supernatural beings, but honestly, the word angel means messenger, and in that sense, falls far short of doing justice to the description of the power and the might and the ability and the purpose of these divine beings. You say, how many supernatural beings are there? How many angels and demons, to use the title of our, of our series, are there? The Bible doesn't tell us how many they are. We know that among themselves they do not procreate because Jesus said that when we get to heaven, we'll be like the angels, we'll neither marry nor be given in marriage. But when you come to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22, the writer of Hebrews says, you've come to New Jerusalem, to Mount Zion. You've come to, watch this, an innumerable company of angels. We don't know how many there are. We assume, based on things we read in Scripture, that there would have to be billions upon billions of angels. And we'll look at how we would arrive at that in future messages. We know this in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4 that in one of the angelic rebellions, because there were multiple angelic rebellions, it's not just one, but there were multiple rebellions, that in the first one, Satan or Lucifer took a third of the celestial beings with him in rebellion. So we assume there are billions of supernatural beings that the majority are still connected to the purposes of our God and the minority are in rebellion to him. You say, what are angels like? Well, uh, and when we're talking about whether we're talking angelic beings or whether that are related to God or supernatural beings that are more than just demons, though we use the term demon generically, and I understand that, but uh, honestly, demon itself is a very limited term and does not do justice to the powers of darkness and their function. What are they like? What are these beings like? Well, first of all, they're persons. 
not persons in the sense that they are human. I mean, it's not like, oh, somebody you love died and now they're an angel in the heavenly choir. That does not happen. People don't become angels, and angels don't become human beings. They can appear as human beings, but they are not human, nor do they become human. These supernatural beings are not robots. They are persons that possess the attributes, and I think personhood could be summed up by three attributes. Number one, they have an intellect, they have emotion, and they have will. They have an intellect. They're capable of thinking. We know this, that in, in Ezekiel chapter 28, and verse 12, it tells us that Lucifer in his original state was full of wisdom. He, he was very intelligent. Matthew 28, and verse 5, the angel says to the women who come to the tomb, I know who you're looking for. They have understanding, observational insight. In Daniel chapter 11, an angel explains to Daniel the plan of God. So they know a lot of things, but they don't know everything. Angels, neither angels, celestial beings, or the powers of darkness. Neither category of supernatural being can see the future. Like us, they are limited by time. God exists outside of time. He created time. Angels are in time, for they were created. There was a moment where they began. Prior to that, there were no angels. So they are, they are creatures of time they are learning they don't know the future you say well how does a fortune teller tell people the future they tell it inspired either by trickery on their part or by evil power that having watched humanity for millennia has a really good understanding of how things will play out. You know, the longer you watch something, the longer you, uh, you know, how many like to listen to Tony Romo and when he does color commentary? Uh, if you're not a football fan, this means nothing to you, but those who are, you listen to Tony and he'll say, here's what they're going to do. And time and time again, the team does it. You're like, what in the world? It's like he can predict the future. No, he's played the game long enough. He's a student of the game. Therefore, he is able to talk about the game in a way that says, given the circumstances, this is what is going to happen. And more often than not, he's right. This is the way that supernatural beings work. We know this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, that angels themselves long to look into salvation. We know that evil beings can't see the future. Had they been able to see the future, they would not, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, they would, have not, they would not have crucified the king of glory. That's Paul's whole point. Had they known the future, they would have never let Jesus get to the cross. So they cannot see the future. They are intelligent, but they don't have the abilities that God has. They have emotions. Listen, when a sinner repents, they rejoice. They sing at creation. The evil powers hate God. They hate his plan. They hate his people. They have a will. They can choose. They can make decisions. They can decide. So they are persons. Second, they are spirits. They're not flesh and blood. Even though they are spirits, they are limited. And again, they cannot be everywhere all at once. Satan can't be here and there and everywhere. He can only be in one place at a time. Their body is what Paul calls in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 44, a spiritual body. Now, you'll notice, some of you are noticing, hey, he's not putting any of these scriptures on the screen. If I do that, I will stop. I will read it to you. I will talk about it and we will get out of the first service at about 12.30. So, it's for your sake that I do not do these things, okay? So, uh, I'm restraining myself. They told me I have 57 scriptures as it is. That is plenty. That leaves me uh, less than one a minute unless you want a 57-minute message. Hey, some of you are saying go for it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to save you from yourself. 
They are powerful. Psalm 8.5 says, we were created, created a little lower than the angels in this life, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, in the next life, we will judge angels. We will rule over them. They're exceptionally powerful. In Revelation chapter 7, four angels hold back the four winds. Amazing. When you, when you look at, at uh, the Old Testament, 2 Kings 19, one angel kills a 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Now let me give you some descriptive names, and I mention these names because often we're, we're thinking only of angels being angels, but when we're talking about supernatural beings, there are names that give us insight into their nature, give us insight into their rank, give us insight into their function and their purpose, and the names I'm going to give you would apply to both good and evil supernatural beings. You say, and maybe you're wondering as we do this, why are, you, why are we taking time to do this? And I think that's a valid question. I want to just pause long enough to say this, because in order to walk with God and walk by faith, you have to have an eternal perspective. And in order to read your Bible and understand the Bible, you have to have an eternal perspective. In order to operate in God's supernatural world and experience his supernatural power to the degree that he desires for you, you have to have an eternal perspective. As well, when we understand how God works through angels, how he works with angels, it helps us to understand how God wants to work through us and with us. As well, Understanding the powers of darkness, why they rebelled, how they rebelled, what they're trying to do in the world, how they're trying to oppose God, helps us to understand how to fight the good fight of the faith. Knowledge about the supernatural realm helps us understand more clearly God's plan and his work in our lives, both now and in the future. It helps us to understand God's redemptive heart for the earth from the beginning in Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the end in Revelation chapter 22. God is a redeemer. God is bent on redemption. And God is working both through celestial beings and human beings to accomplish the redemption of people for his praise, for his glory, and for all eternity. And unless we understand supernatural beings, we will not grasp the magnitude, the enormity of what God is doing. Unless we understand supernatural beings and what they're doing and how they're working, we will find ourselves getting caught up in the things that don't matter. We'll find ourselves relegating the work of evil powers to something as narrow as demon possession, which while horrific, is a minuscule part of what the powers of darkness do and want to do. They are much more concerned about other things. So it's important for us to understand these things that you and I might give ourselves fully to the purposes and plan of God for our own life and be able to function with an awareness and intuition and a sensitivity to the spiritual realm. Well, supernatural beings are called, I'll just run through several things quickly, several terms. They are Spirit. They are called spirits. The heavenly hosts are spirit beings. They're not embodied in the same way that you and I as humans have a body. In fact, you get an idea of this in a, a very, we're going to come back to this passage because this is very instructive for us and says much to us about how God interacts with both good and evil beings. And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. This is from the Old Testament. This is from Second Chronicles. There's a parallel passage in First Kings chapter 22. Um, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab, the king of Israel? Remember, he is, a, he is the worst king that had ever reigned up to his time. 
He's an idolater. He is, he's married to a woman by the name of Jezebel, and uh, they are wicked, they are godless, they are worshiping all kinds of false gods, and he's encouraging the nation of Israel to do the same. He does not acknowledge the true God. He is confronted by the prophet Elijah and still lives in rebellion to God. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab the king of Israel that he might go up and fall or die at Ramoth Gilead? Now I want you to notice, here's the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right and on his left. What you have is the divine counsel. A lot of times we have the idea that God unilaterally acts. The God, he's God, he just does what he wants. But what you find here is you have a divine counsel and as a part of that divine counsel, there are as well evil supernatural beings that are present. So I don't get that. Where do you get? Remember in the book of Job when all the sons of God came to present themselves before the throne of God and God said to Satan, where have you been? And he says, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. Do you remember that interaction that God has? The idea that Satan is in hell is, is something that is not true. Satan is not in hell. Satan is operative on the earth, and Satan is in the, the courts of heaven accusing and slandering you and I. Here what you have is you have God asking this question, and one said one thing, and another said another. So you have a discussion among the angels. How are we going to carry out the will of God? Can God just do it on his own? Can he just strike Ahab dead? Yes, he can. But God does not, though God has his will and can carry out his will. Listen, let's put it in this way with you and I as believers. God can declare the gospel himself. He doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. But God has chosen to involve us in his plan and in his purpose. It's very, very interesting. Do our prayers bring about the will of God? Yes, that's a part of involving us. We're talking to God. We're asking God to thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. God, we want to see you work on earth like in heaven. We believe this is your will. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? It's, there are some parallels here. That's why this series is really important for us to understand how God works. Maybe you never thought of God asking the angels, what, what, how should we do this thing? And one said one thing and another said another. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I'll entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Well, right away, that tells you this is not like a, this is not like a wonderful angel. <laughs> this is a lying spirit. And he, that's God, said, you will entice him. You will succeed. Go out and do it. Now, that creates all kinds of mysteries. And you're saying, how do we resolve those? Come back in two or three weeks. <laughs> All that to say that spirits are involved. We, we could look at Judges chapter 9 where God allows or sends a spirit to cause confusion between Abimelech, remember he is, he is a son of Gideon, and the men of Shechem. We could look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 where an evil spirit from the Lord tormented King Saul. Now, well, that blows your mind. You see it again in chapter 18, in case you missed it in chapter 16, it happens again in chapter 18. You, for example, if we look at Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 5, when the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you've heard with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I'll make him fall by the sword in his own land. What, what, so what's, what is he, what's that telling us? That there are spirits that can direct the thinking, the thoughts, the decisions, and the actions of people. 
It's very, very interesting. They are spirits. All I'm trying to get you to see is to classify supernatural beings as angels and demons oversimplifies it and misses much of what God intends us for, for us to understand from his word. And if we, don't, if we don't train our mind and our eyes and our ears to think differently about scripture than perhaps we have thought before, we will miss much of what is happening in there and fail to understand how God brings about his purposes on earth, in our life, and what's at stake. Number two, holy ones. Look at this. Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones. You say, what? And the heavens are not pure in his sight. He's not talking about the stars and the clouds and the galaxies. Heavens is another word for angelic beings, celestial beings. You say, why doesn't he put any trust in them? Because he knows what? That a third of them fell. He, he understands. And as far as we know in Scripture, there is nothing in Scripture that says other angels could not rebel. And this seems to indicate God's understanding of that. These beings then are not infallible. They're not incorruptible. What we're talking about with holiness, you say, but he calls them as holy ones. We're talking about proximity to his presence. We're talking about an alignment with his purpose. We're talking about an affiliation with him, which makes them holy. Same for us. We're, we, on our own, would not be holy, but because of Jesus Christ and our not only affiliation, or you could say affiliation, by which we become the children of God, we are now holy, right? That wasn't a very strong amen. <laughs> I think I might have lost some of you back in 2 Chronicles. You're still like, I don't even get it. Psalm 89. Let the heavens praise your wonders. Is it possible for nature to praise God? Absolutely. Are we talking about that here? I don't think so. The heavens are celestial beings. O oh Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Let's go. Let's move quickly here. Stars. They are called stars. We saw that Job uh, 38 verse 7. When the morning stars sang. It, it, in that word star, it's, it's the idea that they are transcendent. They are in the heavenlies. They are, they are outside of the realm of this earth operating for purposes, many of which are known only to God. Here's another one. Gods. Gods. God has taken his place in the divine council. We just saw that divine council, right? The heavenly hosts all gathered together. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. They are gods. You say, in, in what way are they gods? They are not gods, little g, like our God, big G, but they are spiritual beings. In fact, you'll read over and over again in the scripture, the gods of this world are what? Not gods. They're not God. They are, they are lesser. They are not without beginning and without end. They are not all-knowing. They are not all-powerful. They're not all, but they still are supernatural beings that have great power. Psalm 97 verse 9. We, we used to sing this song a lot if you've been in Christianity for very long, 20 years ago. I exalt thee, remember it? Where did it come from? For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods, every other god. You're exalted above the heavenly host. They are called angels, and that word means messenger. They are called ministers, which could be understood as one who, who, who takes care of or attends to one's superior. They minister. They carry out God's will. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers. So his hosts, that's an angelic being. His ministers, Psalm 104, he makes his messengers, that's angels, winds, ruach. He, one, 
One translation says, he rides the wind of his hosts. That the spirit, he rides on top of them. Some of them create the means by which he moves. They carry the Lord. And when the Lord comes with all of his hosts on a cloud of glory, what do you think that is? I would suggest to you, he's coming and all the holy angels with him. He's coming on them. He's riding them as the wind. His ministers as flaming fire, bringing judgment. Number seven, an interesting word, watcher. Watcher. You say, now what would that mean? This is an easy one, class. <laughs> He's watching. They are watching you. You say, what do you mean? Well, these are not guardian angels. Because guardian angels aren't watching you, they're watching who? God. Their angels always behold the Heavenly Father. They're watching him because if they watch you, they'll miss his story. He's saying, hey, he's getting ready. She's getting ready to do something really stupid. And so the best way, like in my case, the best way for my guardian angel not to have a nervous breakdown, don't watch me, watch God. You know, then, then you'll be at the right place at the right time, right? So I'm very accident prone. That's why I said that. Debbie's like, I don't know how you haven't had like 15 million wrecks in, you know, because I've got a guardian, I've got many guardian angels. <laughs> I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, this is Daniel writing, a watcher, a holy one, come down from heaven. What's this angel watching? He's watching King Nebuchadnezzar. He's watching what's going on. He's listening to what he says. He, he has a purpose. Now read what happens next. And the sentence is by the decree of the watchers. Wait a minute. Here's a guy who's going to be sent seven years on a journey of insanity as judgment from God. How does that happen? The sentence is by the decree of who? The watchers. So angels are involved not only in executing God's judgment, but in adjudicating part of God's sentence on situations based on what they've seen. The decision by the word of the holy ones to the, again, the, if you miss the first one, then there's the second one. I'm just simply saying angelic beings, supernatural beings are, are much more active in many more ways than you and I would ever imagine, which indicates their ability, indicates their power, indicates their authority indicates their presence, indicates the variety of their creation, and we err if we don't understand that what we say applies to the good beings does not equally apply to evil beings. I'm trying to make anybody afraid, but, but I think we need to recognize what exactly we're dealing with when we're dealing with these beings. Fascinating scripture, which, uh, again, you say, well, how does that work? Well, I, I, here, I'll give you a, a more uplifting than that. That's kind of like, oh, wow. So I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How, who, who do we got there? We got the watchers. They're watching you. That's cool, isn't it? And they're rejoicing. If you're away from God today and you repent, wow, there's, there's angels watching you. And they're rejoicing because they know they've been watching you all along. Here would be another scripture that would speak to that. Because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. They're watching. You're, you're a spectacle. You're like, you're like, they're like, hey, get a load of this. <laughs> they're watching you. Well, they're hosts, they're mighty ones. These are what I would call the classification of warrior beings. These are God's special forces. These are the special ops. This is the Green Beret. This is the Navy SEALs. These are the angels. You wouldn't want to mess with any of them, but I mean, when you get to these people, these are these beings, they're like crazy warriors, and they'll take you out. Look at it. 
Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Who is this king of glory? Appropriately, this is a better translation, the God of angel armies. Praise the Lord, you as angels, you mighty ones. The word there is gibor. In, in the Hebrew, when it's used of a man, uh, a gibor halil, it's a man of honor, who's a great warrior, who is valiant, who is courageous, who has distinguished himself as a fighter, doing, if you want an idea, you know, read, read the exploits of David's mighty men in, in 2 Samuel. You get an idea of, the, of, of humanly speaking, what a gibor, what a, what a mighty one is like, and then just like multiply it like 10 billion times, and you come up with an angel. These are angels who have distinguished themselves as mighty warriors. Think about that. Maybe surrounding you. Maybe going with Daryl and Christina down into Haiti. And when Satan was like, I'm taking them out, one of the mighty ones said, go ahead, make my day. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying these, you know, this is a very exciting world. And this is real. Well, cherubim, and these are those who guard the throne. If you're invited to the throne of God, you're, you're welcome and they will welcome you. If you're uninvited, they will spew fire at you and take you out. I mean, this is the word of God. This is the teaching. You have, an, you have examples. They appear several times. But in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. So they're, they're different. They, they, these have wings, but they're creatures. They're different. In appearance, their form was that of a man, but each of them had four faces and four wings, and their legs were straight, and their feet were those of a calf, gleamed like burnished bronze, and under the wings on the four sides, they had the hands of a man, and so they have the face of an ox and an eagle and, and a man. And, and so these are, are uh, and a lion, these are very fearsome beings. And wherever God goes on his throne, they move any direction. They move, they're there. They're, they're blazing, brilliant. Well, number three, God created these supernatural beings to fulfill specific function. Looked at what they're like, what's their function? Well, we saw, first of all, to contribute to the divine counsel, number one. And again, that scripture in Second Chronicles, and I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, all the hosts standing. And one said one thing and one said another. Now, let me, let me explain it to you this way. God had decreed that it was time for wicked King Ahab to die. Remember when he took Naboth's vineyard? You read that story, God says, that's... That's it for you. But he allowed debate and participation among his council on the circumstances that would lead to Ahab's death. Further, God sovereignly made the decision, but he allowed the sovereign beings he had created to carry it out. Again, it's not that God can't figure it out. It's not that God was like, you know what, guys, when it comes to Ahab, I'm all out of ideas. God says, Hey, here's where we're headed with this thing. What do you think? You see the same thing in Daniel 7. This is an interesting. I watched as thrones were put in place, and the ancient one sat down to judge. This is God. And his clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. So this is Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. Brilliant. Sapphire pavement under him. Millions of angels ministered to him. And many millions stood to attend him. This is very, very interesting. Why millions? Are the millions just standing around saying, well, if he needs a glass of water, my turn will come in about a billion years. No, it's 
Millions attend him because he's got millions of things going on. Millions attend him because he is the God who sees everything, is everywhere, knows you personally, and he says, hey, I, I need to take care of Jack. I want to, I need, hey, you, Susan needs help right now. I mean, this is the kind of thing you have going on. You have the God of heaven conducting business and the God of heaven caring for people. This is a, it's a, it's staggering. These people are not, these beings are not wasting their time. Then the court began its session and the books were open. So what do you have going on? You've got a council. You've got judgment. You can read it. It goes on and talks about it. Thrones are put in place. Who are these for? These are for angelic beings who occupy a place of great authority. We don't know who they are or what they're like. Are they the four living beings? What do, what do we find? We find the, in the book of Revelation, 24 elders. These are not human beings. These are 24 elders, angelic beings who have such capacity, such power, such knowledge, such influence. There's 24 of them, and they cast their crowns down and worship. I mean, there are too many passages to, to give you all of them, but you get an idea of what's happening there. I got to move on here. They assist in governing the world, the human world. So, uh, Deuteronomy 20, 32, this is fascinating. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind. What do we have going on here? We're going to look at this. This is one of the angelic rebellions. This is the Tower of Babel. This is, this is Genesis 11. What happens? He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So the angelic beings are over what? They're over the nations. And what you have happening here are not, it's not good. You've got demon, you've got evil beings, and God says, listen, I'm disinheriting the nations at Babel because the nations have rejected him, and he turns them over to demons. It's a shocking thing. All this to say, there are angels that are over geographic regions. There are evil beings that are over geographic regions. Listen, have you ever gone into... Um, have you ever gone into a town, and the minute you got there, you're like, oh my goodness, this is a bad place. And then you went again another time, and you had the same feeling, so it wasn't that you were having indigestion that day, and you're like, oh, that pizza made me sick, and I'm taking it out on the city. No, it's, it's the matter of, <laughs> I don't know why I say those things. <laughs> But you go in there and you know it's not good in that place. Right here. Nations, regions, states, counties, cities, neighborhoods. Interesting. In Daniel chapter 10, we get a... Uh, an angel comes to Daniel to give him the vision, the meaning of the vision. Watch this. As soon as you, that day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. The Almighty, surrounded by millions and millions, says, wait a minute, Daniel's praying. He needs an answer. Go, give it to him. The being heads out. Boom. Boom. The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me. Who are we talking about? We're talking about a demonic being powerful enough that, that he stops, delays God's plan until Michael. Who's Michael? He's one of the archangels. Another class we didn't even mention. Comes to rescue. I mean, this is the, the, the spiritual world is startling. Number three, they deliver divine decrees and explain divine activity. For example, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, we were just there. I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people. We could look at several. Number four, they execute divine judgment. Genesis chapter 12, remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? 
angels show up in the city. The men of the town try to rape them, try to sodomize them. What do they say? Lot, you get you to get out of the city, for we are about to destroy this city completely. The outcry against this place is so great it has reached the Lord, and he has sent us to destroy it. We've got divine power. First Chronicles 21, we read this. Second Chronicles, friends, First Chronicles 21. You got it, Cameron? If you don't, it's that God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. Number five, they give glory and praise to God. Now, listen, they know him in a way we don't. And all they can think is worship. I mean, think of this. Isaiah goes into the throne room of God, and there are seraphim, which are a, a, a type of cherubim, and they stand around, and this is all they do. All they do in Hebrew. Kadesh! 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 Holy! 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 Is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then they do it again. Back and forth, back and forth, an antiphonal voice over and over again. That's Jesus. Isaiah, John says, Isaiah wrote that when he saw Jesus in his glory. You say, well, don't they get tired of doing that? I mean, I, I mean, after about an hour of that, I mean, 15 minutes, and I've had it at James River. <laughs> Listen. That just simply shows how little we know of God's glory and his goodness. Because if you saw him for one second, everything in you would say, you're worthy of all praise. And you'd never be able to stop. And in the words of that hymn, when 10,000 years had passed, you'd say, what? What? I thought it was just on my knees for a second. I'm just telling you, ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name, Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you holy ones. They worship the Lord. But not all of them. Some of them refuse. And we'll find out why next time. But right now, I just want you to know something. That the supernatural world is real. That there are beings, supernatural beings, so fearsome, so powerful, so mighty, that you and I can't begin to comprehend the magnitude of who they are what they're like, and what they do. And the fact of the matter is, the spiritual realities, listen, this world is more than what you see. There's a lot more going on than meets the eyes. We live in a spiritual world with spiritual beings. And what happens to you spiritually is absolutely critically important. Let's pray.